Well, good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's start the seminar in an unusual time today. It's a pleasure for me to introduce someone that you know already very well, Philip Ball. He's a chemistry, he has a bachelor in chemistry, but a PhD in physics. The bachelor from the University of Oxford, the PhD from the University of Bristol. He's a freelance science writer, as he defines himself. Uh, he worked in Nature as editor in uh, physical science for 20 years and uh, as a consultant editor after that. He writes a uh, popular press uh, that covers topics that range from cosmology to the future of molecular biology and now in quantum mechanics. He's author of many popular books including uh, the works on nature of water, pattern formation in the natural world, color in art, the science of social and political philosophy, the cognition of music and physics in the Nazi, Nazi uh, uh, Germany. He has delivered many lectures, but uh, in important places like the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the NASA Ames Research Center, the London National Theatre, and the London School of Economics. Philip con con uh, continues to write regularly in nature. He has contributed also to publication to uh, journals like uh, New Scientist, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Financial Times, uh, and others. And uh, he has broadcast on many occasions in, in radio and TV. And he's presenter of the Science Story uh, program in BBC4 that you can follow online. So thank you very much, uh, Phil, to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, uh, I thank you. That, uh, uh, even after that introduction, I sort of feel like I should maybe say a few things about who I am so that you can decide for yourself how to how seriously to take whatever I tell you. Um, I did tra train as a scientist and then I uh, moved into my editorial job at Nature and I had at that point no journalistic training um, or training in writing and in fact I've not really received any uh, training of that sort in a formal way ever since. Um, which means that I've had to learn about the job the hard way by making mistakes and uh, uh, make, well, making mistakes many times until I finally um, realize what I'm doing. Um, I'd started doing that, gosh, over 25 years ago now, and um, it's, it's quite different today for anyone going into science communication and science journalism in that nowadays there are, certainly in the UK and I suspect probably in every country, there are courses in science communication and science journalism that one can take and that most be, many people do take before joining as an editor on science magazines and journals. And so they start with much more knowledge of the process than I had. But I consider myself lucky in some ways to have start, joined Nature when I did because at that stage Nature was just, it was just a magazine. It wasn't this publishing empire that it has become. It was just a single magazine with a tiny staff. Um, and uh, this meant that I got to do all of the aspects of putting the magazine together, even the, down to the fine details of cutting and pasting text that, you know, of the news pages, for example, to put onto page. And in those days, it literally meant cutting out with scissors and pasting in place. Um, and I mean, and, you know, this probably sounds extraordinary now, like something out of the 19th century. But when I joined Nature, you know, it didn't look far off this kind of thing. I mean, it wasn't quite that long ago, but it, it was, uh, and, and in the sense that we still used typewriters. There were no word processors even. You know, the, I remember the, the, the secretarial staff got some word processors, and this was a big revolution. Um, and my job at Nature wasn't involved in science writing as such, but what I, one of the most important parts of the job was to help authors structure their papers into uh, something that was hopefully concise and understandable. Um, and what it, one of the things it meant was that almost always we as editors would be involved in writing these introductory first paragraphs that Nature Letters still have, um, which are supposed to give you a, a general, uh, supposed to give any reader a sort of general idea of what's in the paper. And um, I, I'm sure we usually failed in that respect to make something that was comprehensible. But I think that in physics, we probably failed less badly than in biology, uh, where, you know, this is, I mean, it's, 
perhaps unfair to use examples, but this is the kind of thing that then happened and that still happens. And I'm going to come back to that, actually, in a bit. Um, and I left nature gradually over a period of about 10 years, reducing the work that I did there more and more as I wanted to write more, particularly to write books about science. Uh, and these days, I'm, I am completely freelance, and I divide my time between writing books um, like these, and, uh, and which uh, are more satisfying, but less financially rewarding certainly if you count you know per word what you get paid is it's it's really you don't write for the money put it that way mm -hmm. um so the you know what what pays my wage is the journalistic work that i do um and as uh claudio mentioned you know that has diversified into other things like presenting this this series on uh, bbc radio um and i'm going to say a little bit about why science communication is done and what I think the value of it is. But I want to talk, first of all, more um, in, in a broader context to make some suggestions about communicating science, which I hope and I think apply across the board, whether you're writing for your fellow specialists or for the general public. And um, I've been in the fortunate position of having to think about writing for those very different audiences and everything in between. So, you know, those first paragraphs for nature were clearly for other scientists. Um, and uh, if I wrote a News and Views article for nature, then it would be, I would, I would be able to be more and would need to be more generalist, um, but still at a much higher level than I could get away with if I was writing for New Scientist. Um, and even in New Scientist, I, could, I can still get away with much more. I say get away with. I can write at a different level um, than I would if I were writing in a newspaper, where even if you mention an electron or thermodynamics, you know, you can't take it for granted that people will know what you mean. And it's, it's reasonable that you shouldn't take it for granted, I think. Um, books is, is a different matter, because um, I try to write books that will be accessible to anyone without a scientific training. Um, but if someone is reading a book, they have already made a commitment to it. They've invested some you know, time uh, and, and determination to keep going, um, uh, as long as it's not too terrible. And so, there, um, and so there, there isn't the same urgency to tell the reader what they're going to get out of this straight away that you need to have if you're writing a short piece for a, a, a magazine or a, or a newspaper. Um, so is there anything that these very different types of writing share in common? Well, to answer that, um, I've turned to a writer who has, has actually, uh, is still writing, much more, much more experience than I do in science writing, which was Tim Radford, who was the science correspondent for The Guardian for many years. Um, and uh, uh, some years ago, many years ago, actually, I saw these tips that Tim had put together for science writers, and they're still one of the best sources of advice that I know of. And for time, from time to time, I still go back and look at them. Um, and I'm not going to say everything about what Tim said, but I want to pick out a few of these suggestions that I think can be applied, whether you're writing for FizRev Letters or for you know, El Pais or whoever. Um, and so I've paraphrased the way Tim put them to hopefully, um, you know, maybe sort of make them a bit more clear or a bit more general. So one is, as he says, when you sit down to write, there is only one important person in your life. This is someone you'll never meet called a reader. <laughs> and some writers um, insist that you always have to have a clear idea of who you're writing for. And others say that you can, you, know, you can never know that. There's no way of telling who is going to pick up your paper or your article. And I'm not sure that this really matters. Um, we, we all know that any reader, whatever the extent of their knowledge, wants to read a text that, for nonfiction at least, is well organized and doesn't tell you unnecessary things. Um, and that doesn't leave out necessary things that's equally important. And that has a beginning and a middle and an end. And the reader needs to feel that, I think this is important actually, the reader needs to feel that the writer is interested in what they're writing about. Uh, it's less obvious than it might sound. Um, 
and this is a nice one. Writing is important, but it must be never full of its own self-importance. Nothing sends a reader scurrying off faster than pomposity. Therefore, simple words, clear ideas, and short sentences are all vital in storytelling. And um, here's uh, one that I, I think is actually crucial. Um, here is one thing, Tim says, to carve in wood and hang over your typewriter. You can tell how long ago he was writing this. No one will ever complain because you have made something too easy to understand. Um, now, you might say, is that really true? Won't a reader, you know, reading my paper in Fizz Revlet, say, think I'm an idiot if I'm explaining these obvious things to them? Well, you know what? They really won't. Um, this is one of the few valuable things that I think I have learned in science writing, which is everyone assumes that other people know more than they actually do. It's really, uh, really, really common, and I think it's something that blights the scientific literature. Um, so, and, uh, uh, you know, or else sometimes the jargon and the symbols that he used to um, communicate in a scientific paper, I think they're, they're, they're actually not necessarily there to communicate, but to uh, sort of to act as a badge of identity, to say, look, I'm part of your club, <laughs> so I'm going to write a diffusion equation. <laughs> Um, so, you know, and you know, you've, you've all seen this at a conference that, you know, someone will flash up their equations faster than you can, you know, even get to the end of them. Why do, why do they do that? Well, I think it's like a secret handshake. You know, it's a way, it's a kind of reassurance, you know, to, for, for the speaker and for the audience to say, look, you know, this is a proper research paper. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I really think that is, I don't mean to sound cynical by that, because I do understand why pe people feel comfort and security in using those codes. But I also really think no one cares whether you use them or not, actually. Um, and you, 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 know, you can show the details of the calculation to anyone who wants to know later on. What really matters is the, the, the physics in, you know, in, in uh, cases like uh, we might be considering, and the logic of your argument, and not the deltas and the epsilons. And I had a bit of a, an epiphany about this um, s many years ago when I was sitting in a scientific conference and I thought, you know what, I'm going to ask the stupid question at the end because I don't, I don't quite get this, this thing. Um, and I, was, I realized I, for years, had been thinking, well, everyone else obviously does. So, you know, I'm not going to ask that question. Um, and actually, I, I now realize that most audiences don't get it. Um, you know, that they will have the same question, most probably, or they'll be glad if someone asks that question. And so I do that now, and I, you know, blunder out with questions in conferences because I just feel, you know, it, 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 that there is a value in doing that. And it's the same with writing scientific papers. Never worry that you're going to look stupid by explaining too much. In fact, the chances are you'll look smarter by doing that. Um, and Tim goes on to expand on this point. He says, if in doubt, assume the reader knows nothing. However, this is crucial, never make the mistake of assuming that the reader is stupid. The classic error in journalism, and I think in writing generally, is to overestimate what the reader knows and to underestimate the reader's intelligence. So that's really, I really try to remember this. And it, it, there's a, maybe a sort of corollary of, uh, of, of this idea, which Tim writes, and this is one of my favorites too. Here's another thing to remember. Every time you sit down at the keyboard, a little sign that says, nobody has to read this crap. And that's really, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if all scientific papers were written with that in mind? And again, I feel a little bit mean to pick out a particular example, but I picked up, when I first talked about this stuff a year or so ago, I picked up a copy of Nature at Random, and I knew that I'd find in there something like this, um, which is, you know, part of a Nature First paragraph. Um, and, um, you know, the truth is that the authors clearly have a big challenge here, because there's a lot of jargon that they can't avoid. Um, but all the same, I'd have worried... Um, if, if I'd written a nature paper that began like this, because um, there, are, there is a better way um, if you're prepared to, to, to think about it. Um, and, you know, it, it's, um, and for example, 
do we need to, how much of this information do we need to know at this stage? How much of these acronyms do we need to have? Or these abbreviations do we need to have? Because even if you could go and look them up, they deter the reader straight away. And um, do we need to, you know, I had to look up transdifferentiation. Does that mean the same as differentiation? Or do, I'm not sure. Um, so, um, uh, here's my suggestion, it's not a perfect suggestion, but this is something that, you know, they could, I think, have done um, to rewrite this sentence, leaving out some of this jargon, um, to start off by s making a statement of what's really going on here, and ending with a statement of what, what, you're, what question you're asking. Um, and it just takes, I think, it's four more words uh, that I've used to, to say this. And clearly, you know, there are some things that the, the author is going to have to define later on in the paper, but that's okay once you know why you're reading it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 it, it seems to me that the, there was an important part of the story left out here um, that I've tried to put back in here. Um, now, this, uh, this may not be a perfect solution, but the key point, is, and this might sound surprising, I think the key point is that the trick that you're aiming to pull off here is, in fact, hardly any different from the one that a good novelist has to master. Um, here's a, a, an, an, another um, first few lines of a text. It's not a paper, it's a book, and you might recognize it. Um, and this is from Camus' book, the, uh, called The Stranger in, in English. Um, and uh, this is, um, he could have started this book with the way that he summarized what his message in this book was about later on in an interview. He said this. Um, and, you know, that's not a bad first line for a novel, actually. It sort of, but, but in a way, uh, the trouble is that it takes you from the beginning to the end of the novel in a, in a single jump. And what novelists have to decide is, uh, is what to say now and what to leave for later. And they make that decision using sometimes the opposite principle to a scientific paper in that they want to leave you guessing. They want to leave you, you know, with questions. But the basic challenge is still the same, and that is what is the right way to order and organize your information in order to achieve the result that you want. Um, how, that's to say, how to tell your story most effectively. Um, you, you need to know in, in what order the reader needs to encounter and know things. That's really what you're trying to, to think about. Um, and you also need to choose the words carefully um, in, in, that you use to, to, to do that. And this is um, another one that Tim uh, put across. And I'm sure there are equivalents in Spanish. I think English is particularly bad for having long words where short words can do, but I'm sure that uh, it's the, same, the same is true in any language. Um, and this actually is why sometimes I find that scientific papers written by people whose first language is not English are better than those written by native English speakers because perhaps by necessity they must use simple words and simple phrases. Um, this is something that uh, is very relevant to writing a news story about science, um, but I think possibly it's true of scientific papers as well. Um, a story will only ever say one big thing. Um, if, for example, when you're feeling very brave, you have to deal with four strands of a tale, and sometimes you, you do, make the intertwining of those four strands the one big thing you have to say. Don't even start writing until you've decided what the one big thing is going to be, and then say it to yourself in just one sentence. And I've just been speaking um, to, to some of you here, you know, about how, what, what would happen when I, if I was pitching a story to a, a, an editor, and I have to think about that. What, what, what is it that I'm trying to say in one sentence? Um, what is the message of this paper? Um, now, you might say that writing a scientific article is different from writing a newspaper article. You know, sure, in a newspaper story, you, you've got to have a single point. But in scientific research, sometimes what you're saying is too complicated to boil down to a single take-home message, you might say. Um, and there's something in that. 
Um, for, for one thing, in journalism, a good writer will choose words carefully enough to state the main conclusion uh, while not overselling it, uh, you know, in the light of all the uncertainties and the complications that might be involved. But a journalist can't systematically list all those caveats and qualifications in the way that you are obliged to, if you're being honest, in a research paper. Nevertheless, the same principle remains that I think any good paper um, has a point to make. You know, whether that point is, here is a useful new technique, or here's an experimental observation that doesn't seem to fit the theory, or here's an amazingly useful discovery. You know, it's, is it the, what kind of story is it? And if it's one of those, then tell that story. And that's why writing those first paragraphs in Nature many years ago was such a valuable exercise to me. Because in 150 words or less, we had to be able to say what the subject of the work was, what the key question is that it sets out to address, what was discovered about that question, and why it matters. And until you're ready to answer um, concisely all of those questions, you might not be ready to write the paper. And I know that might sound obvious, but you, you, you might still find it useful or entertaining to look up a few random papers in any journal and ask, you know, does it meet those criteria? And many will not. Um, and sort of related to this, this is uh, Tim's suggestion, there's always an ideal first sentence for any article. It really helps to think of this one before you start writing, because you'll discover that the subsequent sentences write themselves very quickly. For um, a scientific paper rather than a, a, a magazine article, I would suggest there's probably an ideal first paragraph rather than, than, than sentence, or, you know, or an ideal abstract. Um, and uh, it, it, sometimes in, in newspaper writing, it tends to be rather formulaic what you have to, what you have to say. But when you're writing longer articles, you can be a bit more creative. And um, I was, uh, I, I always quote, these are both two old articles that I wrote, but I quite liked the first sentences here. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, I don't know if anyone, you're, uh, Jeff Ozin is a chemist, so if anyone actually knows him, you might, <laughs> might raise a smile, because Jeff is very exuberant, um, and uh, you know, I couldn't resist this one. Um, but, my, but my real point here was actually that um, I came up with those first sentences just after I'd gone on a, one of, I think, probably the only course on science writing, sort of very late in the day, a sort of refresher course about scientific writing. And um, I was just reminded that actually, you know, it's worth trying to do this, to find an arresting first sentence for this kind of article. And um, that reminded me, and I think it's very important to say, that these are skills that can be learned, that can be taught and can be learned. It's, um, there, isn't a, uh, there isn't some mystical thing that you either have or haven't got in, in, in writing. Um, it's a craft that can be taught. And... Um, you know, that's really worth remembering. And it's actually a craft that can be taught and often needs to be retaught. And I'm sure that my first sentences have become much more drab since all this has faded from my mind. Um, and I think that most people can learn to write well, well enough, um, if they have the right guidance and put in the right effort. Um, here's uh, one of Tim's uh, suggestions. Um, and... Using metaphors in popular science writing uh, to explain scientific con concepts is all very well. In fact, I think it's one of, probably one of the most important tricks in communicating science. And some people have a knack of finding metaphors that are not just the, you know, apt, but are also fun. Uh, and this, this works really well. And you know, it won't surprise you, I'm sure, that Richard Feynman was, was one of them. And here's one of the really nice metaphors that he uses. And it's long. But I'll read it out because it just is so nice. He said, I don't know, he's talking about the dissipation of energy here. And he said, I don't know if uh, you have ever had the experience, I have, of sitting on the beach with several towels and suddenly a tremendous downpour comes. You pick up the towels as quickly as you can and run to the bathhouse. Then you start to dry yourself. And you find that this towel is a little wet, but it's drier than you are. 
you keep drying with this one until you find it's too wet. It's wetting you as much as it's drying you. And you try another one, and pretty soon you discover a horrible thing, that all the towels are damp, and so are you. There is no way to get any drier, even though you have many towels, because there's no difference in some sense between the wetness of the towels and the wetness of yourself. In the same way, if you imagine a part of the world that is closed and wait long enough, in the accidents of the world, the energy, like the water, will be distributed over all of the parts evenly until there is nothing left of one wayness, nothing left of the real interest of the world as we experience it. You know, it's fantastic, and uh, it, it's typical of Feynman. Um, but you might think that, okay, metaphors are all very well for getting the gist, uh, getting across the gist of the idea that you want to convey to a general audience uh, where you don't have to be rigorous. Um, and so they're fine for scientific books and, you know, for popularization, but not for scientific papers. But actually, I think that's, um, that's not true at all, because a great deal of science is about making metaphors and drawing analogies. And I, and I suspect that the ability to do that is a part of what makes a great scientist like Feynman. Um, in fact, Douglas Hofstadter and uh, Emmanuel Sander have, re have argued in, in this book that analogies and metaphors are actually what we think with. They called it the fuel and fire of thinking. They, they're just the tools that we all use, you know, often unconsciously, to think about science. And Einstein was particularly good at, uh, at, at, at using them. So don't be frightened to use metaphors. Um, so these are, are words of wisdom that I've shamelessly stolen from Tim Radford. And I just wanted to end by adding a few little scraps of things that I've, I think I've learned in the course of what I've been doing. As far as scientific papers are concerned, there's a lot of online information now about how to construct them. Um, and uh, here's uh, one example you can find online, and it contains the following um, interesting observation. Scientific art research articles provide a method for scientists to communicate with other scientists about the results of their research. A standard format is used in these articles in which the author presents the research in an orderly, logical manner. This doesn't necessarily reflect the order in which you did or thought about the work. And I think that's sound advice, but it gets to the heart of something important, because we tell ourselves that scientific papers are clear and objective accounts of what was done by the researchers. But they're obviously not quite that. They're artificial constructs that are made to serve a particular purpose, a rhetorical purpose, to tell a persuasive story. And they're, so they're not really descriptions of what you did. And, you, you know, everyone kind of knows that. The Nobel laureate biologist, uh, Francois Jacob, recognized this when he said that there are, there are two kinds of science, he said. There is day science, which is the official face of science with its seminars and articles, and textbooks and papers. And there is night science, which is actually how it's done, uh, with all its confusion and doubt and mistakes and inspiration. And... Um, when, the, uh, when that night science comes to be written up, he said, uh, quote, we replace the real order of events and discoveries by what would have been the logical order, the, the order that, 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 that should have been followed had the conclusion been known from the start. Um, and I don't think we need to apologize for this, but there are consequences. And one of them is that it distorts the picture of how science is done, not just from the, uh, the perception of the public, um, uh, but also, you know, scientists themselves may start to believe, actually, that's what I did, um, so, that, that, um, so that they think of science as a system of rigorous and systematic hypothesis formation and falsification. And we know, you know, it's not quite like that. And it tends to mask, I think the trouble with that is it tends to mask the creative aspect of science, which is crucial. And what this says to me is that the rules of writing a scientific paper, although they're not arbitrary rules, there's a reason for them, they're not inevitable either. Um, a paper needs to be organized, but there's not necessarily just one template for doing that. And I think you should never be afraid to break the rules if you feel you've got a good reason for doing that. Um, and remember that there's also no rule against making a scientific paper interesting and entertaining and maybe even exciting. Um, 
And while we're on the topic, I can't resist uh, showing you another piece of advice on writing a scientific paper. This is one, I won't read it all out. You can read it for yourselves. This is in the Annals of Improbable Research. Oh, that's the <laughs> Francois Jacob. Um, so there's too much on there, but you get the gist after a little while of what, <laughs> what's really going on here. Um, now, uh, for my BBC radio program, I write my own scripts, um, which are combined with, with uh, interviews with specialists. And it's hugely interesting and useful to see how differently science has to be approached on the radio as opposed to in print. Um, and this being the BBC, it doesn't mean that science, the science has to be dumbed down, but just that we need to be aware of how differently information is read, uh, is, is listened to and processed. When you're, when, you're, when you're hearing it. So sentences have to be simpler on the radio, and the information has to be sparse, as sparse as possible. So, you know, in all the stories that I tell, I'm, I, I have to try to limit it to just two characters. Otherwise, it gets too confusing if you introduce more. And you have to think about how to create opportunities for putting sound and music into the story, to punctuate it. But more than anything else, I, I've found that writing these scripts helps to tune the ear to perhaps the most, uh, uh, one of the most important but elusive aspects of writing, which is cadence, I think cadencia in, in, in uh, Spanish. Um, and that's something that's kind of hard to teach, but it's, but it's possible. Um, so here's a piece of advice that I would recommend for any writing. I don't always obey it myself, but I really should, which is to see how your words sound when they're read aloud. Um, and this, in turn, leads me to a very obvious and general thing about communication. And the, even though it's obvious, I think it's often forgotten that, forgotten that reading, listening, and comprehending are cognitive tasks that someone has to do. Your reader, your listener, has to do it. Um, and why, uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, why do I say something so obvious? It's because we need to remind ourselves that an ability to take in and process information depends not just on what information is in there, but how it's presented to us. We need to roll it out in a sentence or in a paragraph or throughout the document in a sequence that makes the logic clear. The words should guide the mind through your thought. So the reader or listener needs to know where we're going with this. And by the end, they need to know where we've arrived and what we've learned. And this applies to all communication. Um, you know, whether you're speaking to children or whether you're writing a technical document. So the aim should not be to demonstrate the size and the power and the dexterity of your brain, but to be considerate to the brains of your readers or your listeners. And there are many um, uh, considerations that allow that to happen, and some of them are explained, it's a little bit small, but in this very nice book by Yellow Lee Douglas called The Reader's Brain, which, you know, really focuses on what on, on getting you to focus on the brains that are trying to understand this stuff that you're trying to communicate. Well, finally, um, I want to ask, you know, why, why do this anyway? Why try to communicate science, or at least why try to communicate to a broader audience? Um, I find that increasingly funding agencies want to see an impact of the work that they support, and this includes the impact of public engagement. Um, so, you know, there's a motivation that, that the funders want to see it. And scientists, I mean, let's be honest, there's no shame in it. Scientists often like the publicity. They like, it's nice to see your name in print or your photo in newspapers and magazines. That's fine. Um, there are some people, there are some scientists I know who still feel that pub any publicity means you've sold out. And so they avoid the press. Uh, but I think that, uh, that attitude is, is starting to, to die off. Um, but I don't think most scientists try to communicate simply because they have to, because you know, that's what funders want, or because they are going to, their ego is going to be boosted by it. From my experience, they see it as part of their responsibility, as a, as a component of the contract that they've drawn up with society, with the society that hosts them and that supports their work. And I'm very glad to see that, at least in the UK, and I think more broadly, Scientific institutions and organizations are starting to recognize that communication of science is a valuable part of the work of an academic, something to be welcomed and not to be sneered at or to be ignored. And the reason for that is that it's ever more understood that a well-functioning 
democratic society, if any such societies exist anymore, um, <laughs> has citizens who are well informed. You know, the challenges we face from global warming to infectious disease and the opportunities that new, te that new technologies offer all demand informed decision making across the social and political spectrum. So an understanding of science is no longer a luxury. And in the past decade or two, the business of science communication has shifted from just trying to inform the public towards a model that involves engagement and debate and discussion. And it's partly with that in mind that I see my own role increasingly less as a science communicator and more as a science commentator, um, a science critic you might say, but not uh, meaning someone who attacks science, but a critic in the sense that there are arts critics and theatre critics, someone who tries to provide context and commentary um, on what is being done. So I, want, I would like to see a, a realignment of the way we think about science itself in all of this. The, the writer Richard Holmes, whose wonderful book, The Age of Wonder, um, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite science books of all, and uh, it talks about science in the early 19th century and its, in, uh, its, its interactions with romantic poets and so on. And it, he ends his book with what, to me, is now virtually a manifesto for what I try to do. He says, perhaps most important right now is a changing appreciation of how scientists themselves fit into society as a whole and the nature of the particular creativity, again, they bring to it. We need to consider how they are increasingly vital to any culture of progressive knowledge, to the education of young people and the not so young, and to our understanding of the planet and its future. For this, I believe science needs to be presented and explored in a new way. We need to understand how science is actually made, how scientists themselves think and feel and speculate. The old rigid debates and boundaries, science versus religion, science versus the arts, science versus traditional ethics are no longer enough. We should be impatient with them. We need a wider, more generous, more imaginative perspective. I hope I've convinced you that this is something that is both possible and is worth striving for. So thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. Questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, what exactly did you mean when you said um, you shouldn't uh, overestimate the reader's knowledge, but not underestimate his, his intelligence? Okay, I overestimate the knowledge is clear, but underestimate the intelligence? What do you exactly mean by it? How would you do it in the paper? Because I feel that they overestimate my intelligence. Mostly. They overestimate your intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I think they probably, I think they probably overestimate your knowledge. You know, I think that happens very often. For example, it amazes me what economics writers, correspondents, get away with in talking about, you know, interest rates and inflation and so on. That are kind of familiar words, but actually people don't really know what they mean or what they imply. If, if, and I always think, if I was a science, you know, as a science writer, I could never say use a term like that without reminding people what it means. Um, so, you know, I think that sometimes that would be the problem if you're feeling they're overestimating your intelligence. No, I think they're overestimating your knowledge. But um, intelligence is something else. You don't have to do the thinking for them. You don't have to tell people what they should think about this. Um, you should, you know, if, if, if you impart the information in, a, in an understandable way, um, people can often reach the conclusion or the, you know or draw conclusions without having them them spelt out so it, it, it it's I, I think that um, it, it, it's a it's a subtle thing but uh, but I think I think that's that's the difference that um, people often will feel they're being and I think this happens with children a lot they often feel they're being talked down to um, and that's what you want to avoid you know, uh, so uh, by all means, make it as clear as possible what your terms mean, but avoid talking down to people. I have a question. What do you think about the uncontrollable number of papers that are being published nowadays? 
Uh, yeah, crikey. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult for me, too, to keep up with, um, you know, as a journalist, to try to keep abreast of uh, what, what, what is happening. And I, but I think that, um, I think it is a real problem. I think it's a product of things like, um, uh, you know, impact factors and metrics. Really, you know, that's what's driving it, and the, this this pressure to produce papers, you know, does mean that um, papers. Some, I, I feel papers sometimes do get written before they're ready, um, because you have to, particularly, I think, as a young academic, you know, you have to be showing what you're doing, you have to be producing, um, and uh, you know, I think that that's a mistake, partly just because it clutters up the literature, you know, so that you get four papers where actually one would have done the job. Um, but, but also, what I hear increasingly is that people, again, particularly young researchers, say we don't have time actually to think. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but I think it does seem to be a real problem to just reflect and think about what you're doing rather than having to get on and you know, write the next paper or the next grant proposal. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it, it is a problem that there is this real pressure to... Do you have any proposal to solve um, <laughs> No, I don't, I'm afraid, um, because it's... Uh, because, I, you know, I think what frustrates me is that everyone seems to agree that that's a problem, and yet somehow nothing changes, or it only gets worse. And, you know, I don't know whether that's because the people who are driving this process in funding agencies you know, are, are no longer, if they ever were, active scientists, and so don't, you know, understand that's part of the problem. Um, it, 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 it just seems very frustrating that everyone in science seems to recognize this problem, but, you know, the people in charge don't, aren't able to do anything about it. And, um, and it's... Um, you know, I think often uh, scientists and departments are only responding to the pressure that they have to, you know, show a good impact factor in some measure, and usually a bibliometric measure, you know, that, that, that they would rather not be doing this either. So I don't really know what the, what the answer is. I mean, I was very um, mixed about when Nature started to produce all of these sister journals. I'm, gl you know, I'm, I'm glad that they've all done well, um, but frankly, it's because Nature is a commercial business, and y you know, the, the, if, if one does well, the, the managers want to, know that they want to have the next one because they know that that will also bring in more money. Uh, it's as, you know, it is as, as simple as that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do feel that sometimes there isn't a, you know, a real call for some of these journals. Some of them um, have filled a gap that wasn't there before, but I think some of them are produced because they are money makers. Um, so I don't really know how to change that culture, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know if anyone else has no. ideas about that. is the rotation you use the paper. I mean, in physics, you don't call V the mass. You don't call the mass V. And you use the sub-index or super-index in the, in the printer world. So I spent some time when I write the paper thinking about the rotation. What should I call something which is sub-index, super-index, how many should I use, and the names I use for the, the letters I use for the, for the concepts. That's what's important. Yeah. For the quality of the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I mean, this is a, um, ha has become particularly a problem in, in biology and in some ways one that is hard to avoid, that people find there are two names that turn out to be the same gene, um, you know, because they do qu two quite different jobs, so they're, they were identified in different contexts. Um, and you can see how that situation can arise, and it's very difficult to know how to do anything about that that isn't going to then retrospectively confuse the, the literature. Um, so, you know, in a, in a field as complex as molecular biology, um, that's, that's a problem. Um, but I, I, I agree with that, but I, I, I also um, think that part of that clarity, too, is to uh, make sure that the physics of an equation is clear and is 
it's that, I mean, sometimes it's obvious. You can see, okay, that's the noise term, and, you know, that's the diffusion term or whatever. But, uh, you know, I think it's worth spelling that out and not assuming that people will, will understand that. Because that, to me, seems to be the most important thing for clarity, for something that is, you know, that is using equations and that is mathematical, to make sure that the, the, the physics is stated in words as well. I have another question. Sure. What do you think about these this, uh, uh, companies that offer improving your writing, improving your English in the text? Because it seems that it's important to succeed in high impact factor journals. What do yeah. you think about this? Because it's we that we are not English speaker or native speaker, we have problems to write the paper. It seems to be necessary now to have someone that improve that to succeed, which is... I mean, well, um, I, I haven't had any experience of them. I don't know how, how, how good they are. But one thing I would say, as you know, while I was an editor at Nature, is that the language, the, 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 uh, the, the quality of the English language used to write the paper was with very rare exceptions, never the issue. It was never a problem. There were, you know, once or twice, perhaps in those days, in the 90s, we might get a paper from China that it was really hard to understand what had been done, you know, a China or a country like that. Where, you know, nowadays that wouldn't happen in China either. Um, but it was very rare. Um, and I think sometimes people, I had the impression that people whose first language is not English are more concerned than they need be that that is an obstacle. Because I, like I say, often it's those papers that were actually more clear. Um, you know, that I, I have not really seen any correlation between how easy a paper is to follow and the, the command of English that the authors have had. Um, it, it, because what makes a paper easy to follow is about how the thought is organized. Um, so, uh, you know, unless, the, unless the, the command of language is, is, is really poor, I don't, that, that isn't a problem. So I suppose I would say don't be too worried about that. I mean, I, again, I get people, um, you know, scientists who I've dealt with in the past saying, you know, can you improve the English on this paper? And I'm happy to, to do that. But I, I think that's a secondary consideration. Oft, and often when I do do that, I think actually the reason I'm finding this hard to understand isn't the language, it's the way you've organized the, the way that the thought unfolds. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, just um, about the uh, uh, writing scripts for, for radio or maybe for a public, uh, uh, a public audience. How do you measure the, the risk of not being rigorous in some metaphor, for instance, or in some basic explanation of some, some term or some concept? How do you measure the risk of, of not being rigorous enough on, on that topic? Yeah, it, it's a tricky one. And, you know, I, th this, it's a question that I've been particularly thinking about recently because my next book is about quantum mechanics and trying to sort of talk about what quantum mechanics really means. And uh, the part of the reason I wrote it is that I became aware that the metaphors that were being used weren't just a little bit, you know, unrigorous and, uh, and, and fuzzy. They actually falsified the real meaning of what quantum mechanics was saying. Um, but they just had become so pervasive and so common that, you know, that, that had become forgotten. Um, so there is that risk. And I think, you, you know, sometimes, I mean, the problem, I think, sometimes with metaphors is that they're too good. Uh, you know, the selfish gene is a classic example. It, it's, um, you know, it's, it, 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 when you really, really think about it, not only does it not really make sense, but it, um, it, 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 it misleads, I think. Um, but it's so close to making sense, <laughs> that the problem, and it's such a powerful metaphor that, um, you know, that, that's, that's really the problem. Um, you know, I've sometimes, in fact, I recently reviewed a book where they were, someone was trying to explain quantum electrodynamics and they ended up with metaphors about uh, clotheslines being strung between chairs and towels being hung on them and after a while, I thought, hang on, I've <laughs> lost this metaphor. I don't know, <laughs> you know, I, I can't create, I can't see this picture in my mind. Um, so it wasn't that it was a misleading metaphor, but just that it wasn't working. You couldn't, you know, you, you lost sight of what it was you were trying to explain. Um, 
But I think, it, you know, it, it's very hard to, it's a very good question and very hard to answer that because it really is a balance. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to think, I just want to give people a feeling of what's going on here. But it's always important to ask, is that feeling, you know, just a rough idea of what's going on? Or is it, as in the case of the selfish gene or in the case of some of the quantum metaphors, is it actually inverting the meaning or falsifying the meaning? And you have to be very alert to that, that possibility. So I'm not worried if the metaphor's a bit fuzzy. I am worried if it ends up being misleading. OK. There are no more questions. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you very Thank much. You.